to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we are in Daniel chapter 2 today. I shocked Greg a moment ago by saying he had head, shoulders, knees, and toes with the words Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. I... I didn't expect that to be a shock. I, I mean, you work at a school. Right? I a Christian teach school. teenagers, <laughs> not small children. I did not know And they know don't like to a... tell you everything that they know? They, they've never told me that one. You want to sing it so people know what in the world you're talking oh, about? Yeah. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, Greece, and Rome. Babylon, okay. Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, Greece, and Rome. That's all there is. Okay. <laughs> no, I will ask them in the future whether or not they've ever heard that. Because this is a chapter, or the the heart of the chapter, something that I come to in almost every Bible class and in history classes, uh, because it is so useful for setting up your understanding of ancient history, but also for establishing your eschatology. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Cool. So King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? Yeah. That's yeah. where this starts. Kind of reminds yeah. us of Pharaoh. It does. And um, at some point, I'm sure it reminds Daniel of uh, Jacob and Pharaoh. Joseph. Joseph and Pharaoh. I'm, in, I'm getting to the point where I'm having tr trouble with names these days. Nebuchadnezzar dreams a dream. And his spirit is troubled. His sleep goes from him. He commands all of the astrologers and magicians and Chaldeans and such to come. And... Um, says, I, I, I've had this dream, I need you to interpret it. And they say, great, tell us the dream, we'll tell you what it means. And he says, the thing is gone from me. In other words, I'm I not telling, remember. I don't remember, I'm not going to tell you. I'm so having you, a hard time recalling, maybe yeah. you could jog my memory. Yeah, if, and if you, you tell me the dream and then interpret it for me, because you're, you know, a great magician and yeah. such. Yeah. So, and they say, um, that's no, your majesty, that's not the way. Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. This is how it works. You should this know this. This is how it's always worked. Yeah. But Nebuchadnezzar, he, he is not a great idiot. Um, he, uh, he's gone down in secular history, not only as one of the greatest generals in the history of the world, but also as a superb architect and builder. His, he himself valued his recreation of Babylon more than he did his military conquest. So he is, he's a thinking man, and, and he's, got this, he's got these guys down. Uh, the moment he hears the excuses, he knows what they are. And mm -hmm. he's wondering, why are these guys on the payroll? <laughs> uh, and um, he says, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. If you make known to me the dream, then I'll know that you, your interpretation is valid. In other words, this is way too important. This isn't just one of those weird dreams that everybody has now. And this is, this is God speaking to me or the gods or something beyond my experience. And it's obviously a communication and I need to know and I need not to be put off or deceived here. So you tell me the dream that I'll know you you know what you're talking about. And they say, then it doesn't work that way. There's, there is no man upon the earth that can show the King's matter. Therefore there's no King Lord or ruler that asks us such a thing of uh, magicians or astrologers or Chaldeans. Uh, only the gods could do that. Well, the King is angry and furious and commands to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. It's a little wholesale there because not every wise man had been invited. For instance, Daniel and his three friends, had not been included. They were junior members of the council, and despite their excellence in many things, that for some reason they just hadn't been included in the original invitation. And, and so basically Daniel pokes his nose out the door just in time to realize that all the wise men are being rounded up and they're coming for them. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going to be executed? What's, uh, okay, whoa, slow down. What's going on here? What's the problem? And the guard, the, king, you know, the king's captain, explains, and Daniel asked for permission to talk to the king, and then Daniel went in and desired the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Uh, despite his junior statesmanhoodness here, uh, Daniel is able to get an, uh, an audience with the king, 
and able to buy time. So the earlier text, the earlier chapter had told us that Daniel had been reckoned better than all the wise men. And so when he asks, he's he's earned an audience. He's earned 24 hours. Not much more. The king wants this done. And of course, we're, we're back to Daniel and his three friends. God has done one thing that amounted to a miracle. He uh, enhanced their health and, and comeliness on a diet that should have done none of that. And so maybe God will do this for them also. Besides, is as you said earlier, this is looking really familiar. A king who has a dream, and there's a Hebrew servant slave for all practical purpose on the grounds. Maybe they are they are here for such a time. But they don't take it for granted, and God doesn't suddenly uh, inspire Daniel with all the information he would like. But they go and they have a prayer meeting. Uh, and we're told, um, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are the young men we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Daniel, talking within his own circle, uses their real names, their original names. They would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish for the rest of the wise men of Babylon. But it, they're not exactly asking that everybody be saved. They're asking that they <laughs> might be saved. Because these other people, in terms of God's law, are idolaters and um, unrepentant and deceivers on top of that. So, And they have no connection with them. Like, yeah, I they don't. They it's don't. mere personal... I don't know. We can't say it's exclusively one or the other, but it seems pretty intuitive to me that they're just like, we, you know, we don't have control over all these people, but us, maybe we can deal with. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but God is overly gracious in that what Daniel and his friends do does spare their lives, as, the lives of the magicians as well. We're told that they, so they have the prayer meeting, they desire mercies of the God of heaven. And then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And Daniel blesses God and says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his, and he changes times and seasons, and ruleth kings, and setteth up kings, and giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So they don't simply, wow, got it, and rush out the door. They stop and they give thanks to God for intervening on their behalf. And Daniel's able to go in and stand before the king. He does say, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king. I, I, I know the interpretation. So Daniel does intercede for the wise men at this point. And the captain says, I have found a man of the captains of Judah, of the captives, the captives is the word of Judah, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Like this was his idea, but you know how bureaucrats are. Everything's <laughs> I found always, him, I found him, yeah. and I deserve credit. Yes, I do. And his, his name went down in scripture for it too. So, you know. <laughs> um, Daniel speaks before the king and says, the secret which the king has demanded, cannot the wise men, astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? Just getting this clear, he's putting himself in a different category from them. He mm -hmm. is not a, a mage. But there is a God in heaven. This is the second time he said God in heaven. Uh, it's not the normal covenant name for God, but it is the name that's often used among the Gentiles. Not just the God of Judah or Israel or of this mountain or this valley, but the God who rules all of heaven and everything beneath it. And who is transcendent. He's not like his creation. He's going to make known to Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Latter days is an expression that is used for the first time um, in uh, Jacob's prophecy of his, over his sons. Generally, it just means in the future, but the more it gets used, the more tailor-made it gets to mean the days of Messiah. The, the, the end of Old Covenant history and what lies after the great turning point in history when Messiah comes. So that needs to be in our head as we, as we listen. Well, what Daniel does, well, he, he again says, this is not because I'm so smart or I have any great wisdom. There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he's making, he's communicating to you. It is important. You, you're, you're rare, Nebuchadnezzar. God, the God of heaven has singled you out 
to let you know the course of history leading up to the end of all things. Uh, that makes you incredibly special. So listen up. This, this, this is what God wants you to know. And he describes what Nebuchadnezzar saw as a dream and what Daniel has seen in a vision. And as you said earlier in that cute little song, <laughs> uh, he sees what is a, a great image or statue, apparently. Very tall, very uh, terrible because of its height and glory. And it is, it's humanoid and it's composed of four metals. The image his head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, and his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. So that's the first thing. And if you look up Daniel 2 or Nebuchadnezzar's dream on the internet, Google images, you will see all kinds of interpretations of what it looks like. And they're all very similar because it's a man and we see how it's <laughs> marked off with four different metals. And as Nebuchadnezzar and later Daniel watch, they see a stone cut out without hands, later he says cut out of a mountain without hands, which smites the, Im <clears throat> the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and breaks them to pieces. So we're, something is, is coming at, as it were, the end at the feet, at the weak spot. And it smashes the, first of all, the, the feet, the toes, all of that. It breaks them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Thus far the vision. And so now Nebuchadnezzar is, is satisfied that Daniel knows what he's talking about. Yes, that's what I saw. And he's got to be sitting there thinking, what does it mean? Why? I don't get it. What's going on here? But Daniel received not only the same vision, the same visual information, but he also has a word from God as to what it all means. And he says to the king, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given unto thy hand, and hath made thee ruler over all. Thou art this head of gold. Okay. So this is, in some respects, a political prophecy. Uh, we're talking about kings and kingdoms. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all things, it shall, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou saw iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seeds of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. And Nebuchadnezzar is very excited, and we'll talk about the last few verses mm -hmm. and, and his reaction later. What God is doing is giving Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and us a panorama of the future. Um, leading up to the advent of the kingdom of the God of heaven, he calls it. It's charted out by four kingdoms. Daniel tips the, his hand on what the first one is. Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Uh, but there will be another, an inferior kingdom, and after that, another, and then finally this last kingdom. He says a few odd things about that, and then comes something these, these four kingdoms, they fill up this human shape. They are human kingdoms. They belong to human history. They arise out of the history of our planet, of God's providence over the affairs of men. But they're not angelic. They're not divine. They're 
they're very human. And there's going to be uh, a two-way change. In terms of glory, these kingdoms become less and less glorious. Silver is not as glorious as gold. Brass is not as glorious as silver and iron and clay. Ceramic is not as, as impressive as brass. On the other hand, if you're going out and hitting things like people, <laughs> gold's not a great weapon. Silver's not much better. Brass, you're getting someplace, but iron... Iron can crush and mangle and smash, uh, although the, uh, the ceramic is kind of an odd element there that he says is going to weaken things a bit. So these kingdoms will come, and then in the days of that fourth kingdom, God himself will set up a kingdom. It comes from outside of history. It's cut out of a mountain, completely separate from this humanoid figure. It's cut out without hands. That mm -hmm. is, God himself is the one who does it. But uh, from the law, Daniel would probably recognize stones that aren't supposed to be touched by human hands. That's how the you... Altar. Yeah, those are altar stones. So there's there's something of that going on here. And it comes and it smashes the image about the feet and knocks it over and tumbles it. But then it it grinds in pieces everything, which there's a strong suggestion that although these kingdoms succeed one another, they are part of the whole thing. These are not... He does not for instance, portray four separate human images. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's the same thing. There's, there, there's a continuity here. And it, as you read through scripture, but also through the secular histories of the time, there, there's kind of a general assumption that, that Persia took over Babylon. Greece certainly took over Persia. And Rome just kind of came along and assimilated everything. It was a little more uh, of an iron, we smash you approach. But there, there was not. When, when we study history in school, it's often next chapter Medo Persia, next yeah. chapter Greece. Mm -hmm. it's, the, the very Bible distinct. Doesn't, very <laughs> distinct. Very clear breaks. Uh, just as one odd fact, uh, we think of Roman roads and how far they went and how straight they were and the engineering. Those were Persian roads by and large, mm -hmm. at least in the east. And Rome came along and perfected them, but then Rome extended them out into the west. So th this was uh, a single humanistic culture, man-centered culture, that continued to develop. And it, and on one level, the glory declined, but on another, the sheer power and toughness of the thing increased. Rome was much larger in its uh, the extent of its empire than Babylon. It was much crueler, more forceful, more successful. On the other hand, Nebuchadnezzar is about to become a God-fearer, and he's going to be charged with writing scripture, uh, something that no other pagan king has ever been allowed to do. And so there is the true glory of the image of God in him. Um, the Persians come along, Cyrus, uh, the first Persian emperor, God calls him my shepherd, my anointed, my Messiah, the one who do all my pleasure, even to rebuilding Jerusalem. And the, and the temple. Alexander at least left everything alone. He read his the prophecies of his conquest and offered a sacrifice to Yahweh, and then went about his way and didn't do much else. Although Jerusalem was sort of under his protection, and the, the kings who followed him generally treated the Jews well until Antiochus Epiphanes came along. And then Rome just came along and picked up the pieces and did not... It, it left the Jews alone, mostly, except when they were being annoying. Uh, didn't try to force them to convert to Roman ways or anything until the, the final Jewish rebellion. So there's a drifting away from a self-conscious acceptance of the roles that these empires were supposed to play. They were supposed to look after God's people. Mm -hmm. And Nebuchadnezzar understood that fairly well. Cyrus and uh, Darius, the first few Persian kings, got that. Alexander... Uh, Josephus said he had a dream in which the Jewish high priest invited him into Asia, and so he understood too, apparently, that he had permission and calling from whoever this God person is. Rome, not really. They didn't care. They just wanted to maintain their peace, but they did it even handedly enough that they were initially a source of protection to the early church. If you read the book of Acts, Rome is not generally the villain. Rome is the one that keeps mm -hmm. stepping in 
um, in a sort of impartial way to say, wait, why are you beating up on these people? What's going on here? Stop that. You don't have the authority. We'll decide and you're just go away. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's what's going on here. Um, but it's leading to a point. It's leading to the coming of this kingdom from outside history. Daniel calls it, uh, he says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom in the last days. You could call such a kingdom, since it's the kingdom of the God of heaven, you could call it the kingdom of God, or you could call it the kingdom of heaven. And when we get to the New Testament and we we open the historical gospels, we find that John the Baptist comes preaching, uh, followed by Jesus, and they both say, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we 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 pretty well are assured what these four kingdoms are, and there's a... There are other prophecies in Daniel that help us um, fill them in. For instance, in Daniel 8, Daniel sees a vision of a uh, of a ram, and he's pushing westward and northward and southward, and no animal is able to stand up to him. He has two horns, uh, but one comes up after the other. And as Daniel watches, a he-goat comes uh, just zipping along as if, as if his feet are not even touching the ground and attacks the ram and destroys him. But fortunately, God explains this. He, he says, this ram that has the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. First, there was Media, and it existed for a long time. But in the days of Cyrus, Cyrus was a Persian, a new up-and-coming, um, head of a new up-and-coming clan, and he takes over, unites the Medes under the Persians, thus the second horn is higher. And, and so we, we're told here what the next kingdom is. And it's not Media followed by a Persian kingdom. Some commentators try that tact. So the silver is Media and the brass is Persian. No, we're, we're told pretty clearly here that this one political military force is the kingdom of Media and Persia. After that, the he-goat with one great horn is the king of Greece, that's Alexander. So we've got the first ticked off pretty clearly, and we come to the New Testament, there are Jesus and John saying the kingdom of heaven is here, and we're told in all the historical prologues of the gospel, and Rome is ruling the world. So the Bible interprets itself, the Bible tells us what's going on here, and Nebuchadnezzar thus has his answer. Uh, God has planned out the history of the world. The world is not an independent, chaotic force that's moving ahead, steamrolling on its own, without controls, without guidance. It is something that God has mapped out and planned, and it culminates in this kingdom that God himself will set up that will come from outside of history, but it will come into history because it replaces these other kingdoms who, we must remember, are political uh, and military and financial and cultural and it picks up the strands of all of them. It doesn't just encounter the feet or toes, because we're told, then was, this is uh, verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone became... Smote that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So when the kingdom of God arrives, there are still strands and elements of all of the kingdoms there. Babylonian astrology survived. Persian dualism survived. Greek philosophy survived. <laughs> uh, Roman approach to life survived. And each of these found a place in the next kingdom and found its own cultural expressions. And so when the kingdom of God entered the history of the ancient world, it had to deal with all this stuff, all this garbage. But Daniel foresaw that the kingdom of God would be triumphant. It would displace these things, grind them to powder, and it would grow slowly and fill the whole world, become a mountain uh, on its own. It was. It's, it comes from a mountain outside of history. It comes from God's providential kingdom, his eternal reign over the universe, but it comes into history as a redemptive kingdom. Remember the, the idea of the uh, the stone cut out without hands as, a, as an expression of the worship of God through blood sacrifice. This is the gospel. This is, this is the coming of Messiah. 
as as Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, well, Daniel particularly would look at this, there's probably some things that would surprise him. For one, there's no kingdom for Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, Babylon is the greatest, and the kingdoms that follow are lesser, so that can't be Israel. But this kingdom of God of heaven sets up, there's no reference to Israel at all. Uh, not to say that it, she won't have some part in this, but she's not the highlight. It's not that, okay, God will now now establish the Jewish kingdom you've all been waiting for. Mm -hmm. It's it's something totally different, something that is not of this world, as Jesus will tell Pilate. But it will have effects in this world because it will deal with a very real historical, cultural, social um artifacts and impacts of these kingdoms that have gone before. It's enough of a kind with the human kingdoms to destroy them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it was just sort of a ghosty-like thing, it might just sip through them and yeah. and grab some things along the way and go its merry way. But this is something that destroys and displaces these things. And yet, since, it's, since it comes from outside of history and is not of this world, we should begin to suspect that the way it works will not be the way normal kingdoms work. Daniel does not explain this. It's not explained to him. Uh, this is something of what Pilate was up against when he interviewed Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are, you, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus has to ask him, well, what do you mean by that? Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or do the others tell thee of me? What Are you asking as a true seeker, a God-fearer, seeking after the the nature of the messianic kingdom, or are you simply acting on reports that you as a uh, Roman bureaucrat have received and need to do something about? Pilate, Sears, am I a Jew? Your, your own people, your chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? Still thinking politics. And now Jesus can answer, you have said that I am a king. In other words, the words are right, kind of like you said it, but it's not quite that. It's not, yes, exactly. It's the Inigo Montoya. Those words do not mean what you think they mean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the words are correct, but you don't, you don't even begin to understand what they are. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom are of this world and my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Um, you're a king. You say yes and we're done. I'll say it's that I'm a king. For this cause was I born for this reason. I came into the world that I may bear witness to the truth. Everyone that's of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate turns and sneers and says, what is truth? And walks out and says, this man's innocent. Of what you are accusing him of. They were accusing him <laughs> of being a terrorist, in our words. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a political rival to Caesar. And he understands that whatever Jesus is, he's not that. And, he, and Pilate was right. He's not that. But what he could not see, and even the Jews really couldn't see very clearly, was that this kingdom by its very nature is a threat to Rome. Because Rome is built upon the confession that Caesar is Lord. It's built upon a philosophy of continuity of being. All reality is one, and reality is concentrated in the state and in the person of Caesar. And if you can accept that and, and submit to that in all of your social institutions, in all of, all of life, then we'll get along great. Well, the gospel rejects that up front. No, there's, there's, there is a God in heaven who is not part of this creation. And he has his own sovereign claims upon it, and the way to reestablish those claims in the hearts of men is through this gospel message. And Jesus does not specify at when he's talking to Pilate the nature of what's going on, except to suggest that he's not refusing to be crucified, and that's it. Pilate does not, Jesus does not say, no, you see, Pilate, what has to happen here is you need to have me crucified. Because by doing so, I will provide a penal substitutionary atonement for God's elect and then rise from the deadness into heaven and part of the spirit to call, effectually call God's elect and thus win the world to Christ, to myself. He does not say any of that, and Pilate is, is operating the blind. He does get it's a different sort of kingdom. And if you're thinking in terms of armies and terrorism and uh, military funding, no, that, that's not it. It doesn't come like that. It's not something imposed by political means, by military means, by economic means, by voting even. It's something that has to come at a different level. And we wait ultimately to the New Testament to have it spelled out in really short, simple words for us. <laughs> uh, you can think of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, for instance. You must be born again, for God so loved the world. 
whosoever believeth, those kind of things. But the background is here, and here the emphasis is the flow of history. Uh, it, it is interesting in passing to note that the kingdoms from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome, there is a westward flow here. Uh, that one, um, I think Barclay in one of his poems speaks of westward the course of empire. But in his mind and the mind of others, the next step then was England and America. But no, that's <laughs> the next step is the kingdom of God. Thank you very much. Uh, the, these four kingdoms end the proprietorship or stewardship or protection racket that these pagan kingdoms were, uh, were to do with respect to God's people. They were supposed to keep take care of God's people because God's people had really screwed up the whole kingdom thing. So fine, God doesn't reinvent that. He does something brand new and says, you're not, you don't get your kingdom back. You're going to be kindergarten students under the tutelage of these pagan empires, and they will be pagan and decreasing and decreasingly godly, increasingly pagan and violent. And it's in this context I'm going to bring my kingdom from outside of history into history. And, and so this this is a wonderful place to introduce children and young believers and people who don't know much about history to the flow of history from this point on. When we finish Kings and Chronicles, we come to this. And we can tick off the the flow of empire. Babylon, which lasts for about 70 years, and Medo-Persia, and we have um, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and uh, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi are set during that time. And then the canon of scripture closes, but from there on, secular history picks up. We have Alexander, and most people have heard of Alexander the Great and his conquests. Upon his death, his kingdom is divided among his four generals. And uh, one of Daniel's later prophecies details a lot of what's going to happen uh, between the two kingdoms, north and south of Palestine, until Messiah comes. And then this other kingdom that comes out of nowhere, it's not named because Rome didn't really exist yet. There's a couple of references to it like this. The, um, the ceramic uh, is interesting. What's going on there? This would take a study of all of Daniel, which I don't propose to do. But in later prophecies, the, the existence of the Idumeans, the Herods, hmm. um, is highlighted. Because the Herods were Rome's face in Palestine. And both in the Gospel and in Acts, we run into one Herod after another from the, from the Herod the Great who tried to kill Jesus, who killed the babies in Bethlehem and thereabouts, to the Herod who executes John the Baptist, to other Herods later on. Um, and, and the Jews try to kiss up to these guys. In fact, when Jesus is on trial, they say, we have no king but Caesar, uh, thus allying themselves with this kingdom of iron. But it doesn't work. The, the, the Herods can't hold it together. The high priests in there getting in bed with the beast, they can't hold it together. And so it's, it, it doesn't, in the end, the, uh, that fateful alliance doesn't really help Rome. And Rome, in the end, turns upon the Jewish nation and destroys it because they're just ornery and annoying and keep rebelling. But it's in, in the midst of all of that that the kingdom of God appears. A couple of things, as we work toward the end here. Uh, I, 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 there, there aren't really Christian bookstores around anymore, at least in my part of the world. <laughs> Uh, but it used to be that there were Christian bookstores, and you could go in and you could find the prophecy section, which was always large. And in the prophecy section, there would usually be at least one book that's really large and just full of tables and pictures and charts and diagrams. I don't know if it was always the same one, but it may have been. I don't know. But you could open it up and you could see this picture of taken from Daniel of the statue. And it was really great down to some place around the feet. And and then the toes, uh, of which there are 10, were drawn out so as to cover all of the intervening centuries to the return of Christ, which was assumed to be at hand in our generation. So here's this picture of a guy who looks really well proportioned, except for his super elongated toes stretching over an entire page. <laughs> the reason for this is that dispensationalism, and, and they're extreme, but they're not alone, has trouble looking at this picture of the kingdom of God coming and displacing the kingdoms of this world and says, well, that, but that didn't happen. 
So that's something for later. That must be the millennial kingdom that Jesus will set up when he comes again. And the keystone of dis- of classical dispensationalism, I don't think that any, well, any famous, well-known dispensationalists hold this anymore. I hope not. But the idea was that all of God's prophecies stopped when Jesus went to the cross, or sometime shortly before. That the Old Testament prophets had not foreseen the atonement, they had not foreseen the crucifixion, uh, and that the prophecies of Israel being great and ruling the world were all in place, but the Jews rejected Jesus, and so God stopped the clock, as it were. He called time out, threw a flag on the field, and introduced this parenthetical thing called the Age of Grace in the New Testament church. And the church would just percolate along, winning souls to Christ by this method that was not exactly foreknown or foreseen, um, but there would come a time when God would be dead, and he would go back to that original plan, and he would rapture the church out of history and pick up exactly where he left off, which meant the temple had to be rebuilt, and what some people forget is, and the Roman Empire would have to be restored, and thus these elongated toes. They, the dispensationalists, looked at the nations of Europe and said, well, those that was Rome. And someday it's coming back, and the Antichrist will be the ruler of all of that once the church is raptured. And then we can pick it up. And then the stone can come and smash the Roman Empire in the future and fill the whole world, and that's, that's Messiah. The number of problems with this are very large. Um, <laughs> One that it, the first of all, sorry, it's stupid, and which you which you get just by drawing it out and showing these toes, cutting the toes off, and then you know putting a time warp in between them and having the very tippy toes of the toes two thousand years later really is not going to help here. It's to just see it's a it. lot of added interpretive work that yeah. doesn't seem necessary. It's not necessary. Well, yeah, it it just doesn't work. We have to we have to go back and reinvent everything. Yeah. Uh, restore everything, including temple worship and the priesthood and the sacrifices on the altars, all of that that Jesus abolished. And in order to do that as a background, we need the Roman Empire in place. Uh, as if the New Testament church and the gospel of Christ are historical irrelevancies. Yes, they saved some people, but largely in the end were a failure. Now, the reason for this in the original dispensational scheme was because they wanted an imminent second coming. Um, the, the people who invented the system were just disillusioned completely with the church. The churches failed. The state churches were apostate. All the other churches were going liberal. Nobody saw things the way these people saw things. Um, and so obviously it, the, the end was near. But imminent means no, nothing else has to happen. No other signs. Um, when, when they said the, the second coming can happen at any moment, they literally meant it. Uh, they didn't have to have the temple rebuilt or, or Rome restored. All of those things would happen. They would be kick into motion the moment the church left the earth. Until then, there was nothing to do except preach the gospel until God blew the whistle. Uh, and, and God had that under control, and we don't. Um, and so that original system did not allow for saying, well, the, king, the, 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 the rapture is getting nearer. Only in the sense that the church has failed, but that could go, it could go on failing for a long time. They did not know how long. There was nothing else. There was no signs in the sky or the recreation of the, of the Roman uh, Empire through the uh, European Economic Union or Israel back in the land. or None of that was necessary, literally, because none of it was prophesied. Uh, as soon as the church was gone, then everything would revert and all of that stuff would unfold real fast. Israel would be back in the land of the temple. Temple would be rebuilt. Rome would be revived. It all happened just almost overnight to get things going for the last seven years of human history before Christ returned and set up his millennial kingdom. And those of us who aren't dispensationalists or don't have any sympathy for the, at least the classical approach to all that can say, well, that's dumb. <laughs> that's not biblical. And, it's the, and very few people actually believe anymore in that in, the, in an imminent second coming in that sense. Because pick up any book on prophecy. Signs of the times! Mm-hmm. That wasn't the original dispensationalism. There were no signs. But the newer interpreters 
constantly are pointing to this or that. And anytime something huge happens in the Middle East or or worldwide, new slow books about how this is a sign of the end. Well, original dispensationalism didn't allow for that. So that's that's kind of gone. Anyway, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that dispensationalism was not alone in being disillusioned by the coming of Christ. It started with the Jews. They didn't like the kingdom he was talking about, a kingdom which you could not see until you were born again, a kingdom for the meek, the humble, those who thirst and hunger for righteousness, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, a kingdom to enter into you had to become as a little child, a kingdom that would grow like a mustard seed until the end, uh, or like leaven would slowly influence things. They wanted the here and now. They wanted the, the grandeur and the glory and the power. Uh, they wanted Rome kicked out of power and Israel put in power overnight. That's what they expected, sort of uh, an amplified exodus where God just opens uh, the, the resources of heaven and sweeps away all the bad guys and sets them up on power. And that's not what Jesus did. And the Jews couldn't deal with that. And ever since, the church has had a real time dealing with it too. But the keys were here, grows slowly. And the, the kingdom, the stone cut out with hands was a stone, not a mountain. And it, it progressively ground in pieces the remnants of the statue. Daniel the Lord used the figure of a threshing floor. And this is something that John the Baptist used too. Messiah's coming, his threshing f fan is in his hand. He's about to start dividing the wheat and chaff. But it's a progressive thing. It continues to happen <laughs> through the age. We're he still fighting. snap his fingers and find no. the wheat separate from the chaff. <laughs> no, no, he's not some big purple alien. Um <laughs> He, he has a different sort of way. And Daniel's prophecy does not explain all of it, but there are hints. One, it's a different kind of kingdom. Two, it has something to do with worship through sacrifice. And um, three, it grows slowly. It will fill the whole earth, but slowly so, not overnight. Uh, and, and so he's not talking, this, this is not a prophecy of the second coming. This is a prophecy mm -hmm. of the coming of Christ in his first advent. And the, the gospel writers everywhere assume that. They are picking up the language of Daniel. The God of heaven is setting up a kingdom. The, repent, the kingdom of heaven is set. No, repent. If it's a political power bound up in military, might, supernatural miracles and such, what need is there for repentance? Yeah, her attitude has nothing to do with it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and the Pharisees and Sadducees were shocked that to think that they had to change something? They were children of Abraham. They were Israel. What God was on their side. And so when Jesus says to Nicodemus, no, you have to be born again, and God loved the world, they weren't ready for that. It was not the kind of kingdom they wanted or planned on, and dispensationalism has struggled with that, but a lot of even reform commentators have struggled with that. Uh, they, they will not wrestle with, one, the slowness, two, the fullness, and three, that it actually does deal with the cultural, social, political aspects of the former kingdoms. A kingdom in men's hearts, yes, and therefore a kingdom that must change all of society and all of history, because out of the heart are the issues of life. And, and so there's no conflict here between some kind of Gnostic uh, dualism between a kingdom in the heart and a kingdom in the world. When Jesus has his hand on the steering wheel of everyone's lives, they're going to live differently in every aspect of their humanity. But it will take time. And we, uh, modern Americans, oh, if it didn't happen yesterday, it's already taken too long. <laughs> we, just, we just cannot deal with that. <laughs> some some uh, stand-up comedian once made a joke of, yeah, we take our... Uh, Instant potatoes, put them in the microwave, and time goes backwards. Um, <laughs> because we we just really expect this. I remember uh, my former pastor doing a Bible study, talking about how long this process might take. And one uh, dear lady who didn't know much about theology said, oh, you mean like hundreds of years? I said, no, I mean like thousands of years. And she was dumbfounded. 
Well, he tell you, it's already taken 2,000 years and we're a long way from where we need to be. Uh, but we, we his, doesn't history end with us? Aren't we the last generation? Aren't we what it's all about? Aren't we the most important people who've ever lived? No. <laughs> Chew on that for a while. No, we're not. B.B. Uh, Warfield, in one of his articles, concluded with the lines, maybe the church at the beginning of the 20th century is the primitive church. Because he foresaw, in terms of scripture, what God had promised to bring about and realized we're nowhere near there. And so rather than seeing ourselves as the last generation, maybe we need to see ourselves as baby Christians in a baby church, which still has a lot of growing to do, mm-hmm. which which is in a way kind of nice because it means we play a part in a story that has a long way to go. And though our parts, the parts played may be but slight. A, a faint touch here, a little nudge there, over a thousand years or ten thousand years, can have real meaning. Mm-hmm. The work we do now, when laying the foundations for what's to come, is important work. It's not just well, maybe we can save one or two souls before Jesus comes back, but maybe we can change the course of history to conform to what God says it's going to be anyway. Or maybe we can be part of the plan rather than just sit back and. Say there, there isn't much of a plan, or it's all spiritual, or it has nothing to do with culture and society and politics. All the while realizing, though, that the power is a spiritual power. That is to say, the power of God's Spirit himself operating through the gospel. Not a utopian plan, not a social gospel, but the gospel of grace as it changes the hearts of men and thus shapes the course of empire. Mm. That was great. I could listen to that all over again. I probably will. <laughs> uh, shall we move on to recommendations? Sure. You get to go first. Oh, okay. Um, I'm on the spot a little bit, but what you said reminded me of how much I enjoyed life without a microwave. Um, we had a series of apartments when we lived in Maryland, and I think the first one might have had a microwave, but then we had years of... We, we could get a microwave and put it on our countertop, or we could just not and see how we like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, after moving this summer, we have a microwave again. And I forget that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like trying to defrost my chicken in water and mm-hmm. it, just to like fit it in the crock pot because it was a lot of chicken. And I'm like, wait. There's a tool for this. <laughs> um, and then later, David made some corn dogs in the microwave. And I was like, how did that happen so fast? <laughs> um, but honestly, like, I I really like the mindset shift that came with not yeah. having instant food. It's like, I have to spend time thinking about food. And I mean, it's it's nice when, when you get to be a, a stay-at-home mom and have no deadlines and <laughs> hardly any schedule, and you can just take as much time for food as you want. Um, but it's it's really made me think a lot about how food becomes part of life and culture. And, you know, mm. the original intent behind fasting is you're giving up the time you would spend on food to spend time in mm. prayer. And it's like, in, in today's world, when we had a microwave like it wasn't much you know it's like okay so i'll spend five minutes in prayer instead (laughs) no that's that's not it (laughs) um and i've learned to enjoy cooking in this whole process Uh, it's a whole lifestyle change um and it's not really encompassed in not having a microwave but that was an igniting factor i guess I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> maybe well, that's a recommendation. Maybe it's not. <laughs> I, I, I think there may be one in there someplace, if only in terms of how you think about things. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to um, undergird that or put a foundation over it by recommending gardening. Mm-hmm. Uh, another place where you, when you, when you have small children and you're planting seeds for them to see them grow, they come out every day expecting to see something and sometimes impatiently pull things up to see what's going on. Where is it growing? Is it dead? <laughs> yeah, well, it was until you pulled it up here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are impatient with things that take time. Um, just one thing that comes to mind. We come to, we, we're visiting churches and we see a church once and we say, 
No, not didn't didn't, didn't uh, strike my fancy that time. We'll, we'll move on. We we want everything up front right now, and I think like cooking, gardening may help give us some perspective. So many of Jesus' parables were agricultural. Mm-hmm. He lived in a world where people knew that things take time. Before you can even begin the process of cooking, you have to grow your food, and whether it's the sheep and calves out in the pasture, or whether it's the things in your kitchen garden or out in your you know, fields in your farm, it's going to take a while, and it takes a lot of work, and it takes oversight and forethought and planning ahead. Mm-hmm. Recognizing plan- that the seeds you plant now affect the food you'll eat next year. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and so does the condition of the soil, and so does the weather, which you don't have much control over. Uh, I think there probably is something in these things that reconnects us with the way God does things, because so much of the language of the kingdom of God is wrapped up in sheep and shepherds and seeds and fields and uh, banquets and wine that's been aged. Uh, it's it's just because God gives us the technology that can reach the whole planet doesn't mean that that's how he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. We should not um, ignore the technology that God puts in our hands. We should use it. But a certain perspective, I think, is appropriate. That God is not in a hurry. God invented the year. He invented the week. He invented the day, arguably even the hour. And he, he counts these things off. In the first chapter, he counts off days. He's not in a hurry. It took him 4,000 years to send his son into this world. And we say, well, it's about time. But no, that's 4,000 years of preparation. That's the beginning of the story. That's the preface. That's the prologue. Now what? It may take longer than we think. And just as any um, building a marriage, uh, raising children, building a church, building a Christian school, building a business, you're not going to have it all down the first day. And there are things coming that you have no control over. And so faithfulness in little things over long times is something that God does. And it may be that a a, a few less microwaves, a few less instant dinners, and a little more gardening and home cooking might help us get the swing of things. So it's, as you say, it's a recommendation. (laughs) Not not It's not a moral imperative. (laughs) No, no. Just a thought about how life actually does work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for this conversation. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and your lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And a big thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion or our Patreon at patreon.com slash halting towards Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time.